Cheating in chess has a long and storied history, with tales going back centuries and accounts of amateurs, strong tournament players, and even world championship candidates. Nevertheless, none of these stories ever penetrated the public eye, having been relegated to books on history and anecdotes of the game of chess. This all changed in 1962, when a cheating controversy in chess became known throughout the United States and then the world, and at its center was a 19-year-old American by the name of Bobby Fischer. Even in the 20th century, the United States had had several elite players, such as Frank Marshall, Isaac Cashton, Reuben Fine, and of course, Samuel Ryshevsky. But none of them had ever captured the public imagination like the young, outspoken prodigy, Bobby Fischer. And as a result, he was the subject of articles and interviews in popular mainstream media, such as Harper Magazine, The Saturday Evening Post, and even Sports Illustrated. It was therefore no big surprise to see an article in the Sports Illustrated edition of August 20, 1962 on Bobby Fischer. But this wasn't about him. It was by him. It is a testament to his celebrity status and star power that they gave him leeway to publish this massive attack with the very blunt title, The Russians Have Fixed World Chess. The multi-page denunciation by Bobby Fischer was scathing in its content. In it, he explains that the candidates tournament held in Kurosawa in 1962, the Russians had colluded amongst themselves in such a way as to ensure that a Russian would always come out as the challenger, and as a result, the title would never leave Soviet hands. To understand how such an accusation could even be feasible, you need to understand how the World Championship was structured at the time. In 1962, the final stage of the World Championship to decide the next challenger to the title was a massive candidates tournament, similar to today, but with a few differences. The tournament had no restrictions on the number of players from any one nation. And as a result, this eight-player competition had no fewer than five Soviet players. However, unlike today, each player was to face every other player no fewer than four times, for a staggering 28 rounds in all. With four rounds played a week and two adjournments, it meant a grueling seven weeks of almost non-stop competition. Three of the top players, Petrosyon, Geller, and Karras, had an obvious agreement to play quick draws amongst themselves to save their energy and efforts for their foreign rivals. Korchnoi was the odd man out, and Tal was spared of such as he fell ill and was hospitalized for the kidney problems that would plague him throughout his life. As an aside, of all the players in the competition, only one ever took the time to visit Tal in the hospital. Bobby Fischer, who was to be rival and friend of the magician from Riga to the end of their days. This unsportsmanlike concerted effort was not enough, and Fischer wrote, If I was playing a Russian opponent, the other Russians watched my games and commented on my moves in my hearing. Then they ridiculed my protests to officials. They worked as a team. Would Bobby Fischer have won it in the absence of this collusion? Grandmaster Larry Evans, years later, didn't think so, and said, The fact of the matter is that in 62 at Kurosawa, Bobby just wasn't good enough yet. However, it bears mentioning that Fischer's decrying did not fall on deaf ears, and the World Championship was restructured to prevent such things repeating themselves. It wasn't until 2006 over 40 years later, that another world championship would seriously fall under the pall of a cheating accusation. In 2006, after a decade-long rift that had left the chess world with two world championship cycles, a reunification match was finally held to bring them together and declare one world champion to rule them all. On the one side, you had Vladimir Kramnik, the heir apparent who had defeated Garrett Kasparov and still held that title. And on the other was the brilliant Bulgarian player Veselin Topolov, the number one rated player in the world, 
who had won the FIDE World Championship tournament held a year earlier. The match, best of 12 games, got off to a thrilling start, with two wins right off the bat for Kramnik, including a spectacular save in Game 2, when Topalov fumbled his brilliancy and lost instead of winning. Topalov struck back in Game 5, and after six games was behind by one point. Then, 15 minutes before the start of Game 7, Silvio Danilov, Topalov's manager, published a letter accusing Kramnik of cheating by secretly using a chess engine in his visits to the bathroom. In it, he claimed an extraordinarily high match rate of moves by the Russian with Fritz 9, one of the top engines of the day. Of note was Game 2, a dramatic reversal for the Bulgarian, but with an 87% match for Kramnik's moves. It was a powerful accusation with seemingly very damning evidence. The mainstream media dubbed the scandal Toilet Gate. It also became the first time engine analysis and statistics were used to verify and even debunk the inevitability of the conclusions being leveraged when computer scientist Dr. Ken Regan was brought in to help. What happened is I was online uh, when the first great cheating scandal broke at the 2006 World Championship match. And the co-founder of Chessbase asked on that line, is there anyone qualified to evaluate this kind of statistical accusation? And I, as a research mathematician and computer scientist and chess international master, decided I had the right combination and had to leap to the defense of my game. He concluded that while he could not prove no cheating took place, his analysis did show that there were perfectly viable explanations that did not need to include such tactics. The special commission formed to investigate the case decided that there was no evidence to support the accusations, and they were dismissed. This was the first time a world championship was involved in such accusations. But for the first time a human was clandestinely assisted by a computer in a chess game, we need to go all the way back to 1980. In August 1980, in Hamburg, Germany, the German grandmaster, Dr. Helmut Pfleger, was conducting a simul against a lineup of amateurs, unaware that one of them was actually playing the moves of a computer. The perpetrators of this deception were Frederick Friedel, the future co-founder of Chessbase, and Ken Thompson of Bell Laboratories. Ken Thompson is a legend in the computer science field, having created the Unix operating system, the forefather of Linux but was also a serious chess enthusiast and created the chess machine Bell, the first chess machine ever to achieve a master level rating in the United States. This wasn't the sort of machine that could be easily moved around, and therefore the logistics took some serious coordinating. They hid a radio receiver under the hair of a young colleague, Dieter Steinbender, one of the participants in the simul. Friedel was able to talk to him from a vantage point high above the tournament hall, while Ken stood by in New Jersey to deliver the moves by phone. Using a pair of binoculars, Friedel followed the moves on Dieter's board, relayed them to Ken for the computer's reply, and then to Dieter's earpiece via radio transmission. After some hours, the Grandmaster was winning all his games, including the one against Bell. However, at move 49, he missed a clear way to end it, and actually ended up losing. This was all recorded for a German TV program, both as an experiment and a proof of concept. After the simul was over when told about it, Flegger expressed astonishment. I really noticed nothing. Wow, these things are really playing quite well these days. Properly speaking, this was not really cheating per se, but this brainchild experiment by Frederick Friedel was to serve as a warning for the years to come. And sure enough, just 13 years later, in 1993, the first true cheating episode involving a computer took place in a major event. In July 1993, in the World Open, one of the largest chess opens in the world with the richest prizes for such, a mysterious player with no competition record of any kind registered under the name John von Neumann. Yes? the same name as the legendary mathematician. However, this player looked nothing like the famed scientist. According to descriptions by eyewitnesses, 
He was a black man with dreadlocks. Playing in the open section, endowed with dozens of grandmasters, in the second round, he was paired with the grandmaster Helgi Olafsson and drew the game in 21 moves. The grandmaster from Iceland was flabbergasted, but things only got stranger. In round four, von Neumann was paired against Dan Shapiro, a talented master seeking his international master title. After nine moves, still at the board, he simply lost on time. In round nine, with a forced recapture on the board, he got up and disappeared for 40 minutes, after which he returned to the board, played his move, and proceeded to win the game. With four and a half out of nine, von Neumann had qualified for the prize for best unrated player. But before presenting John with the check for $800, the organizer Bill Goichberg asked him to look at an elementary chess puzzle. The player refused, turned, and left, and was never seen again in a chess tournament. Lacking any drawing skills or access to a sketch artist, I fed the description to the AI art software Midjourney. John von Neumann with dreadlocks playing chess. Here is what it came up with. While this may be considered the first real incident, it was but the opening of the floodgates, when stories began to multiply and abound. A personal favorite would be Clemens Alverman, a weak amateur who used a top engine to crush a field of professionals in the 1998 Böblinger Open, even announcing mate in eight against one grandmaster. As outrageous and offensive as the story is, the report by the famed German magazine Der Spiegel was dripping with sarcasm and opens with the lines, Germany has a new genius. In addition to Goethe, Beethoven, and Einstein, Clemens Alberman will soon achieve worldwide fame as a top figure in Teutonic thought. <laughs> Hats off. While limited at first to the unscrupulous actions of amateurs, soon enough, even the professionals would be tainted with this plague. From 2015 to 2019, a 54-year-old grandmaster by the name of Igor's Rouses began an unbelievable comeback in competitive chess. Although a strong player with a very respectable rating around 25-80 fide, he began performing with such clockwork consistency that he reached an astonishing rating of 2686 by 2019 at the age of 57, making him also the oldest player in the world's top 100. These results did not go without raising a red flag, and the computer scientist Dr. Ken Regan informed Fide that something was wrong and to keep him under supervision. The warning was heeded, and it came to a head when in July 2019, at the Strasbourg Open, he was caught red-handed using a mobile phone to cheat in the bathroom stalls. He confessed to his crimes, and after deliberation, Fide banned him from any play under the Fide banner for six years, as well as stripped him of his Grandmaster title. Is nothing or anyone above such ignominy? In January 2016, the blind Norwegian player Stein Bjornsson was accused of cheating after playing games that showed a very high correlation with computer analysis. Due to his disability, Bjornsson had been allowed to keep a record of his moves with a recorder coupled to an earplug. The earplug was later found to be incompatible with the recorder, but capable of receiving messages by Bluetooth. In April 2016, he received a two-year ban on domestic competition from the Central Board of the Norwegian Chess Federation. Yet, no lesson was learned from this episode, since just after finishing his two-year ban, Bjornsson returned to competition only to be caught with a Bluetooth earpiece taped to his hand during a club tournament in Horten. The Federation expelled him in May 2018. These tales are but a drop in the bucket and only serve to show that cheating is neither new nor does it abide by any particular profile. 
Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed this brief stroll down memory lane. I think it was Thomas Jefferson who once said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. It seems that the same can be said for an honest game of chess.